of Kabila, uh, which we went to seminary together. And, uh, and we have been growing closer and closer. And right now, they live in America. They have um, two beautiful kids. But he's going to talk more about himself and his family. And uh, he comes from Dallas, Texas. And he's the pastor there. And, uh, and he's going to be with us for these two Sundays. So this Sunday and next Sunday, we're going to have him here with us, bringing the word of the Lord. And I'm sure that uh, he has great insights and the Lord has given him a word from his heart to you and to bless us all. So Pastor Nathan, would you please come here? And, uh, and I would like to pray for you. And uh, let's all pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this dear brother of mine that is here, this brother in Christ. May your word and your spirit be upon him. Fill his heart. And every single word he says may be from your heart. I want your servant so that he will speak what is directly that you want to be <coughs> Thank you, God, for all that you have done in our lives. Thank you for his life. Thank you for the time that he has opened up his schedule to be here with us and to bless us with the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Douglas. It's such a privilege to be here with you this morning. I'm so glad to be here. And the, the lesson I'd like to talk about, the passage is out of Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 to 27. And as I would share about this passage, I just want you to know this is something I've been wrestling with for several weeks now. And God, I think, has really given me a revival through this. He has given me a new life and a new heart. It's been so exciting for me to see how God has used this passage <coughs> in my life. And my prayer is that this morning, God would use this passage in a similar way in your lives. And that together, as we look at this passage, that God would do something amazing. And so that's my hope this morning, that God would do something great. And that I get out of the way and allow him to do his work. And I thank Douglas for your prayer. Now, Douglas did say that I was from Dallas, I believe. Uh, uh, has anyone heard of Texas before? We have a bit of a reputation. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, we are loud. Like, Brazilians often have a reputation of being loud. Also, Texans oftentimes can be loud. And uh, there's times when I'm in restaurants and I get shushed by other Americans who say I'm too loud. So I think it's a great fit that uh, I'm a loud person and you're with Brazilians. Uh -huh. So, very good to be here. This is the skyline of Dallas. This is where I was raised. I was born near here. I was born to two amazingly godly parents who converted me at the age of six. And so from a very young age, I have served Christ and loved him and known him. And ever since, I've just been trying to grow in my walk. And it's an amazing, rewarding walk, just learning what, it's, what it means to be a Christian and how do I become closer to God. I began teaching at First Baptist Dallas in 2009 in a young singles class there. And there was a karaoke named Camila who happened, like my first day in class was also her first day in class. And I thought that she was beautiful immediately. And she's godly and smart and we developed a great relationship. But since she was there on a visa and I was also the Sunday school teacher, I did not want to begin a relationship with her, and so we became very good friends. We dated other people, and we would always counsel each other through the dating process. And so I would get my heart broken, and she would help me. Some guy would break her heart, and then I would wow. counsel her. And then one day we woke up, and it's like, this is an amazing woman. What's going on? <laughs> Why am I not in a relationship with her? And so on July 4th of 2011, I proposed to her, uh, her family at a Chicago school, and it's awesome. Both her parents 
and most of her uncles and aunts live in Dallas, and so it's great being around the relatives. We were married later on in 2011, and this is us at First Baptist Dallas. We waited four long weeks to get pregnant, and so <laughs> 10 months into our marriage, we find ourselves with a baby. He was born through emergency C-section. God was gracious, he was born healthy, but that was a bit of a scare. And his name's Nathaniel, and he truly lives up to his name. He's a gift from God. In March, we got to add another to our family. This is Samuel Jonathan Rice. He also was born through emergency C-section. So I feel like we have two miracles in our family. Very grateful to God for that. And this is a picture of us all together as a family last week. And so we have Samuel on my shoulder, or Nathaniel on my shoulders, and then myself, Camila, and then Samuel down below. And I've missed them so much after just one day. It's, it's uh, crazy how much you can love people. What's interesting is that when I met her for the first time, I had no idea what the future would hold. I had no idea that I would fall in love with this karaoke. And it kind of leads me to think, how does our knowledge of the future impact our present? I wonder how I would have responded to her had I known that she would be my wife. That, that somehow God would blind her so she would fall in love with me and want to marry me. And so I just want to ask a question right now. If you could raise your hand, how many of you would like to know the future? So we have maybe half. And uh, it's crazy to think about the second question, which is, uh, if so, if we were to know the future, how would that affect our life? There is a movie called, that deals with this question. It's called Back to the Future 2. This was a big movie in the 1980s. We had Back to the Future, the first one, and then Back to the Future 2, a big deal in America. And it has a simple plot, except for the whole time warp thing. Marty McFly and Doc Brown travel to 2015 to fix the mess that Marty McFly's family is in. And we find some surprising facts about the year that we're living in. And want to show this clip regarding a particular event. Take $10 and make it 1000 
You can take $1,000 and make it $100,000. That's a, that's a pretty good deal. And so knowledge of the future can impact and should impact what we do, how we live in the present. We're going to look at a prophet who had a special knowledge of the future and look at how that impacted his life and also think about how our knowledge of the future today can impact our life. And this is in Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 to 27. If you have a phone with a Bible on it, you can flip there. If you have an actual Bible, you can turn in the pages there as well. It's good to give a little background behind this passage. Daniel was a very bright young man who was deported in 605 BC by Nebuchadnezzar. And so he was taken from Judah, which is all the way over on the left side of this map, to Babylon on the right side of the map. And to give you an idea of what that would encompass is that is about 1,500 kilometers. If you went directly, it'd be, it'd be shorter, but you wouldn't have the roads to do that. And so likely, it was 1,500 kilometers. It took Ezra in chapter 7 of Ezra 7 120 days to take this journey. And so if you can imagine a young, maybe in his teens, a young boy, maybe 10, maybe 12, we don't know, making a 120-day journey, a four-month journey, being led away from his home, from his homeland, and everything that he knew, that's pretty traumatic. And so that is in 605 BC. And if you fast forward to the book of Daniel, you see some exciting things. You see him committing to eat the diet that God had prescribed in Daniel 1. You see him in in Daniel 2, interpreting the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, even when Nebuchadnezzar does not tell the dream. And then you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And so if you're Daniel, you see so many ways that God is moving. I want to fast forward over to Daniel chapter 6, and this is 539 BC. And this all gets very complicated, and so I will do the best I can to explain it. I'm still comprehending it myself, but I think it's unbelievably, it's, it's, it's so blowing, mind-blowing to me. So in 539 BC, we have the writing on the wall. And this is when Belshazzar, the king of Babylon at the time, <coughs> when, when he loses his kingdom, he, he takes the, the articles of the temple of the Lord and he is reading <coughs> and celebrating. And then that very night, the Persians enter Babylon and they take over Babylon. And then Cyrus, king of Persia, becomes the new king. <coughs> and then Darius is the regional king over Babylon. And in, in Daniel chapter 9, we pick up and we find a certain prayer that he gives. And as a result of this prayer, we see the return of the exiles to Jerusalem. And so you see a complete turnaround. You see the Jews being exiled in Babylon, and you see God restoring them back over to Judah. I want to read through some parts of Daniel's prayer. And this is in verse 2. In the first year of the reign of Darius and Cyrus, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord, given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. And we see here in Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12, and Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, that the desolation of Jerusalem, that they would be exiled for seven years before they would start to return home. Daniel knew the future, and so he prayed as a result. Isaiah also prophesies about this in chapter 44 through 45, and even names Cyrus the king by name. As a result, Daniel says this in his prayer. So I turned to the Lord, God, and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. 
We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commandments and laws. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. And so if we were to look at Daniel's prayer, Daniel's prayer represents the stark reality of where he's at. His people are exiled. The place where the Jews would worship God has been destroyed. The altar torn down. The temple leveled. The walls of Jerusalem have been torn to pieces. And the houses have all been destroyed. The spot that the Israelites were using to communicate with God, the, the connection with God, has been severed and destroyed. But God has not forgotten his people. Despite the sin of people leaving God, despite the effects of their sin and worshiping false idols and being deported, Daniel still has a future hope. And what Daniel does here is he confesses his sin and the sin of his people. That Daniel assumes responsibility for where they are at and prays that God would forgive them. And I love the part where, where Daniel says that save us not because of our righteousness, but because of your mercy. And that's, that's, the, that's the hope that Daniel has. Daniel is an amazing guy. He's a very godly guy. God uses him in incredible ways. And yet even Daniel, as amazing as he is, as godly as he is, as righteous as he is, he does not appeal to his own goodness. And he trusts in the mercy of the Lord. And he prays for restoration. He prays specifically that God would restore Jerusalem, the holy mountain, on which the temple is built, the holy hill, some translations read. And it's amazing how God answers the prayer of Daniel. And we're going to get into some of the most amazing prophecy in all of Scripture. It's very controversial, and I'll present a view that I hold to be true. If you disagree with me, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. But this is something that I'm convinced of that I think is amazing. And so as Daniel is praying, in verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, and making my requests to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in an earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy place. I'd like, to, I'd like to look at these six things in a little more detail. The first thing that's mentioned is to finish transgression. And then some translations read to put an end to rebellion. God will end the spiritual war. After the 70 weeks are complete, there will be no battle going on. Satan will be bound. There will be no opposition to God whatsoever in heaven or on earth. There will be no more rebellion. There will be no more sin. We'll be free from sin. What an amazing day would that be? I hate sin. And I, I hate it because being human and, and living on earth, it's impossible not to sin. But unfortunately, we're born to practice <coughs> by God's grace. We can experience some victory. And yet sin continues to plague us and plague the people we love and care about. And sin is so ugly as we see all the wars and the fighting and the selfishness in this world. It is so ugly. The third thing is to atone for wickedness. 
And here you see Christ paying for our sin. You see that there are payment for sin. That we're no longer held responsible for all the wrongs that we've done. And so sin will be atoned for. Wickedness will be atoned for. The fourth thing is to bring in everlasting righteousness. And so we'll be in glorified bodies. And we'll be forever in right standing with God. There's no hindrance between us and God. It's pure, sweet worship, pure, sweet fellowship. It'll be us in community with Him, worshiping and praising Him forever. And that is an amazing thing. Because just to be in His presence, to be near Him. And we get a little glimpse of that when we worship Him. But to have uninhibited, pure, amazing worship is the cry of my heart. And it's going to be so amazing. To seal, the fifth thing is to seal up vision and prophecy. There's, there's going to be no more need for prophecy. All the prophecy, all the visions have been fulfilled. And there's, there's, there's no more of that. That the final solution have, has arrived in that Christ, the King, is eternally reigning. And those who put their, their trust in Jesus for forgiveness of sins will forever be with Him. And then to anoint the most holy place. And so the way that I interpret that is heaven. And to establish heaven. And so these are six things. This is the future that we have to look forward to. An end of sin, community with God, fellowship with Him, an end to all the suffering, an end to all the pain, an end to all the things we struggle with all every day, so, so often, all the pains that we're experiencing right now, all the worries, all the anxieties, all the frustrations, it's all over. God, through Jesus Christ, has fulfilled that. That is something to look forward to. That is something that should give us a hope, it should excite us, and it is incredible. And so Gabriel says this to him regarding the timing. Gabriel says, Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the appointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and seventy-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. <coughs> After the 62 sevens, or 69 sevens overall, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. And so if you're reading this for the first time, or it's been a while, you might be like, what? What's going on here? What's a seven? What's going on with this? And from the commentaries that I've, I've read, we'll, 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 we're actually, I will walk you through the calculations where we can get an actual date of what's happening. But the first thing that we're going to look at is it says that after, that to begin this prophecy, if you look in verse 25, from the time the word goes out to restore and reveal Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There's going to be 69 weeks. So the first thing you want to do is figure out, okay, when does the, when does the clock start? When does the word go out to restore and reveal Jerusalem? And so we have in 539 B.C., in Ezra 1, so at, right after this prayer that Daniel prays, there's a group that leaves to go and rebuild the altar in the temple. And, and this is an amazing connection. Daniel prays, and immediately there's a group that goes. And so that's the, that's the first thing that comes. But they, they did not rebuild the city. They did not rebuild the wall. They did not rebuild everything. They just rebuilt the temple. Later on in 458 B.C., in, chapter, in Ezra chapter 7, there's the, they reinstitute worship. And so that's when the, the Levites are commissioned to run the temple. And so that's a second time. But at the same time, there's still no wall, there's still no city, there's just the altar in the temple. And here's our date. In March 5th, 444 BC, and you read about this in Nehemiah 2, verses 1 to 8. The command to restore and rebuild the wall and city of Jerusalem goes out. So this is our starting date. March 5th, 444 BC. This is very important to remember. There is a scholar named Harold Honer who's done a lot of research on this. It's been groundbreaking research. And so as I share with you, this is his stuff. And if you don't like it, you can go to him. So that's that's you can see the complaints too. Uh, but also, I'm not going to take credit for it. The first thing we have to do is look at what a seven is. 
And most scholars would agree that the seven is a period of seven years. In some translations, it says 70 weeks, which would be seven, seven, seven years. So the first thing is that seven and 77 is seven years. And so we need, to, we need to translate the Jewish calendar to the Gregorian calendar. There was a Jewish calendar that they were, they were running by, which was lunar and solar based. And it was pretty confusing. They would have either 355 days in a year or 385 days in a year. They would have leap months. And so to solve all the confusion, they just would approximate one month being 30 days or one year being 360 days. And so if we use these numbers, and this is backed up, if you look at Revelation 11, verses 2 to 3, also elsewhere in Daniel, and then also in Genesis, we find examples of one month being approximated as 30 days. It's particularly important that Revelation 11, verse, is translated one month, 30 days, because that is during the 70th week. And so I think we're on very good grounds to say one month is 30 days. And so if you take 69 times 7 times 360, so the day, the day from March 5th, 44 BC, you look and 173,880 days later, the anointed one, the anointed one should enter Jerusalem. So let's translate 173,880 days to the Gregorian calendar. So you divide we, we usually would say 365 days in a year, and so we've, we come up with 476 Gregorian calendar years plus 140 days. You take the fraction, multiply it out, and you can do all this, it's on the paper. Uh, 476 days, 476 years plus 140 days. But there's a problem. The problem is that you have leap years, and you have a leap year every fourth year except every 100 years. And there's also leap minutes, but we don't need to go there. And so what we have is 25 leftover days. And so what we do is we take March, we take March 5th, 444 BC, we add 476 years, 25 days, and what do we get? We get the anointed one, the ruler, was to enter Jerusalem on March 29th or 30th, depending upon if you start the one on March 5th or after. March 29th through 30th, 33 AD. March 28th falls on a Sunday, which would be the, this Palm Sunday, which would be the day that Jesus would enter Jerusalem. And so as I look over that, I just get goosebumps thinking about how to the day Daniel predicted through Gabriel the day that Jesus would come in for Palm Sunday. And this is the way that Harold Honer explains it. You have 173,880 days equals from the Jewish and the Gregorian calendar, and that's how it plays out. And so to me, that's amazing to see how the, the future was predicted there. But there's still one more week left, right? Let's read about the final week. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And in the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end is decreed, it's poured out on him. And the him is Satan. And so this is talking about the end of the Satan, and this is talking about the, the great tribulation that's mentioned in, in Revelation, in, in my view, in my interpretation. And so what is our future? Our future is found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, which is the end of sin. It's the restoration of fellowship and community with God. It's the beginning of heaven. It's worshiping him forever, being near him, experiencing his love and his joy and his peace forever. And our hope is also the end of Satan. And so Satan would be forever banished. And there's no more war, no more sin. So what do our lives look like as we remember our future? And this is all, there's been a lot of scholarly <coughs> stuff here, there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of calculations, it can be kind of confusing. 
What do our lives look like as we remember this future that in the end, and whether or not you agree with the date, as a, as a believer, we would believe that at some point in time we are in Jesus. So what should our lives look like as we remember our future? This is a very important question for me because, like you, I, I'm sure it's similar in Brazil as it is in America. There's so much stuff around us. There's movies, there's music, there's constant advertising, there's Facebook. I could just sit on Facebook all day and not do anything else. On Twitter and all the other social media. There's all these things that are constantly bombarding us with information. So many ways that we can spend our affections, we can spend our time, we can spend our money. But what do we do? What choices do we make today that reflect the future hope that we have in Christ? And so in just a, in a couple minutes, I'd like for us to break up into groups, and I'll, I'll call Douglas up here to actually do that. But one, you want to consider two major questions. If you want to discuss if the Cubs win the World Series, what are you going to do? That's a fun question. That's great, too. But really want to focus on the last two on the sheet. The first is that what are some things we can do to help us remember our future? And I think the battle is simply remembering the future. I think the battle is, is, is knowing and believing, being reminded constantly that this is not our home, that the things that we are so concerned about on a daily basis are not eternal things for the most part. And what really matters is that we know Christ, we're called by Him, we're loved by Him, and our future is Him. So what are some things that we can do today to help us remember that? Because when we forget, we get in trouble. And so how can we remember? And then secondly, what do our lives look like as we remember our future? So what, what are some things that would change? And so if we are very, if we're very good at remembering our hope in Christ, what changes happen today? Thank you, Lincoln. Um, so we're going to do like this. We're going to have our group discussions. And um, Nathan is going to lead to the advanced English group, and we're going to talk about these questions. So if you feel like you don't need any kind of translation for your English, uh, and you can hold a talk with Nathan, uh, he's going to be leading a group right here to my left side of the front. You can come up and turn the chairs around. We're going to have eight minutes to talk. If you feel like you have another intermediate English and uh, you know talking English but with a little bit of translation here and there, we're gonna have Marcel and Paula leading the intermediate group to my right here, right in front. You can come up here. If you feel like I cannot hold a, a conversation in English, please help me, Douglas. So I'm gonna be back there. <laughs> To help you uh, discuss the questions, and we can, uh, just, if you want to try English or do it in Portuguese, no problem. You feel free, and um, <coughs> it's not. Uh, we are not here to be looked upon. This is to be a community to embrace expats, uh, foreigners, internationals, serve them, and also to help Brazilians uh, improve their growth with the culture of. Uh, international mind person and with also with their English. So uh, we're going to divide these three groups and um, I hope that you keep in mind something that was very interesting that he said that usually we remember our past but it's when we remember our future that is the victory of Jesus Christ that's the way we look forward. And so remembering our future, we go forward, because that's what gives us hope. And um, so I would like you to keep that in mind. And, uh, and I found that very interesting. I didn't know about the, all the calculations of the prophecy, and, uh, and I found that was very interesting. It's like they were true. And, uh, and Daniel predicted that Christ came in the, on Sundays, and then seven days later, 
it's just amazing the destruction of the temple and all of that. Well, let's scatter around, divide in groups. So, advanced English to my left, up intermediate, and then if you want Portuguese back there, I'll be there waiting for you. And then we can finish up the coffee. I think there's still some things here for us to eat. And, uh, May God bless your Sunday and uh, have a good week. And next Sunday, Pastor Nathan is going to be with us again. So we find a friend and bring someone. I think it's going to be a great time uh, together with him. It's going to be his last time here with us. Um, Alexandre asked us before we divide the groups that we come up to the front because he wants to take a picture of the whole group of the service. So if you would please do this favor for him, we really appreciate it.